Thank you, Marcus. Um, I've just come off the two-week court case, so if I uh, suddenly get a bit all law and order on people and objections and so on, uh, please forgive me. Uh, cool. So I'm uh, John Rhodes, the IT and Cybersecurity Manager for St Vincent's Institute of Medical Research here in sunny Melbourne. Um, today we're talking about the Essential Eight. What is the Essential Eight? I think probably a lot of people have a good idea, but it comes from the Australian Signals Directorate, and it's a cyber maturity framework which contains a lot of controls that you can use for your organization. Um, if we take a look at what a, a maturity uh, model is, is rather than a pass-fail audit that you might do with a control framework like uh, ISO 9001, 27001, uh, NIST, um, CSF, instead of having like a pass or a fail, instead, when you do the audit, you look and you see whereabouts does your organization fit um, with it. And so this is one here, application control, maturity level one, none, no um, controls defined, maturity to level one, sorry, zero, none, can, none defined. Level one, we're starting to do a little bit. Level two, we're doing the, the much better. Level three, we're really mature and great. And what this allows you to do is to see in a snapshot in time how you're doing at that point, and then you can say, I want to be at this level in six months time, and then you can do another audit, and see where you're going. So not a pass-fail, instead it is a good way of seeing how mature your organization is. Well, who does it apply to? Why do we care? Why should anybody in this room care about it? Well, if you're a government agency or department, you don't have a choice, you have to do it. Uh, the government has mandated that you've got to do it. You may have contractual obligations to do it. Somebody might say, if you want to do business with us, you must meet a certain level of maturity according to Central Aid. Or perhaps it's a selling point and you can say to somebody, hey, you should do business with us because we are this mature. I'm going to put something to you today that actually everybody in this room, maybe even including some of our overseas guests, are somewhat um, constrained by this and will have to do it. Um, the reason why um, for this came out last year, there was a court case called uh, RI Advice versus ASIC. And these guys, well, for legal reasons, I won't say how bad their cybersecurity was. I will just put this up here. I try it, and I don't think it works particularly well on these screens. So um, if you can't focus your eyes, it is that this is fine dog. I will put it into the Slack later so you can see it works really well on the Mac. Um, basically, their cybersecurity was atrocious, and ASIC had enough. They gave them a few cho uh, chances to fix it and they decided to sue them under the Corporations Act. If you do business in Australia, if you have an ABN, you are bound by the Corporations Act. What was particular about this is that ASIC went after the directors. This doesn't happen. Normally, uh, the only time that a director is ever sued directly is when they are trading insolvently, as in you're writing purchase orders you can't pay. Uh, it does not happen for other reasons. Uh, so this was a real groundbreaking instance your board know about this. I guarantee you this because at um, this last year's directors meet up where all of the directors of every company in Australia, they go along to their association. Uh, this was one of the things that they really spoke about. And so your board knows about this case. They care about it. Of course, if you're wondering, could I be sued? Could my organization be sued for breaching this? Well, how can you say that I'm actually meeting my obligations under the Corporations Act? Well, ASIC says you should follow this essential eight. So here we go. This is how we link it together. Under Australian law, the one way that you may be measured to prove that you are actually meeting your obligations is by an essential eight audit. Hence, you're going to have to pay attention. The essential eight. So what is it? Let's have a look at some of the mitigation strategies that they have. Um, application control, regular backups, configure Microsoft Office macros, patch applications, user application hardening, restriction, multi-factor, patch operating systems. Despite promising you a talk on the Essential 8, I'm actually going to give you a talk on the Essential 4. Um, the reasons for this, oh, we, you can't really see them, is that 
the other ones aren't particularly endpoint. Um, Microsoft Office Macro is largely irrelevant on a Mac. User application hardening is really talking about Internet Explorer, a little bit about Acrobat. Multi-factor, really interesting topic on the Mac, but kind of not relevant yet. And regular backups, probably not talking about time machine or devices, we're really talking about storage and so on. So we will focus on these four. Now, the ISD don't actually have any nice graphics for any of these controls. And because I like to have pictures and I'm not a graphic designer, I, of course, got the AI to create me some images. Um, some of them are better than others. Well, some of them are less bad. <laughs> it's, so let's start talking about application control. What does that mean? Well, let's have a look what uh, the Essential 8 says. Execution of files prevented from win, within user profiles and temporary locations. Level 2, application control implemented. And then to get up to level 3, there's just a few little uh, sort of things on top that you need to do. I actually think this is harder to do um, than the level two. The level one is harder, restricting uh, files from uh, being run within a user profile. Sure, you can do this. I've done this in Jamf. It's just a standard uh, Mac OS profile. I think you could probably even have done it in Workgroup Manager with a, you know, it, it's been around for a long time. But good luck to you if you try and do this because <laughs> it isn't going to work. So many things run in a user profile. Um, you, you're going to spend your life trying to figure it out. So we've got a problem. We can't actually meet level one. Can we jump straight to level two, application control? Well, if we're controlling what applications are run, does it matter where they're run? We'll cover that in a bit. So how would you actually um, implement application control? Um, one of the, the first ones that came out was Santa, came from Google. They, Santa is like the front end client and it will only allow um, approved applications to run. Google were using something called Upvote as a back end. Um, this was quite a cool sort of social voting way of proving, of saying whether you should be able to run it or not. It's now been deprecated, so don't use it. Um, another back end you can use is Zentral, which is sort of an OS query based um, platform. But if you want to go commercial, uh, I would recommend Airlock Digital. This is an Australian product that was developed specifically to meet uh, Central 8. If you're using things like CrowdStrike, it plugs straight in there. And what it really does is it manages the workflow. So if you want to, um, you know, one of the things is how do I get my application to be whitelisted to be able to run? Well, you need a workflow to do that. Um, and ideally one that actually fits in with your patch management. So if this is something you're going to have to do, I'd take a look there. I was kind of jealous of uh, Stu Lamont's Santa on Sledge, so I got the AI to make me a <laughs> cyber Santa, which is really menacing, actually. Uh, yeah, so those are, the, those are the application control strategies. Next, we're talking about patch operating systems. It seems pretty obvious that we should do it. Um, here's what the, the levels are. Let's just dive straight into some of them. We must patch operating systems within one month of release for level one, two weeks for level two, two weeks for level three, or within 48 hours if an exploit exists. That's quite tricky to do. How do you get your operating systems patched? Unfortunately, Apple kind of seems to have screwed up software updates with via MDM over the past year. So a lot of people have either taken to scripting it. I, I, what we've done is we use Nudge uh, from Eric Gomez, now part of the Mac Admins Foundation, which is great. Uh, there's a couple of talks here if you want to figure out Nudge. But what Nudge will do, if you're not familiar, is it will prompt you to update your Mac. And if you've been on the receiving end of Nudge, it really makes you want to do it. Uh, I was on the receiving end. Thank you, Rowan. And I did not enjoy it. And in the end, I updated. Um, it's not enough to just do this. You need to be taking action to ensure that people who aren't upgraded, you do something about it. You log service desk requests, you call them, you block them. It's not enough to push it out there. You really have to force people. There was something really interesting in that maturity level one. Operating systems that are no longer supported by vendors are replaced. Well, with Mac OS, as we know, Apple supports the current version and the previous two versions. There's a few shocked Pikachu faces there. Um, that's even officially on end-of-life.date tells us that Mac OS is uh, supported there. Um, 
I guess we never really had anything clear from Apple saying what version of the OS they supported. I mean, maybe if had enterprise support, they were a bit more free, but you know, in Apple's way, they didn't actually tell you. This came out on the website, on their website earlier this year in January. Because of dependencies on architecture and system changes to any current version of Mac OS, not all known security issues are addressed in previous versions. I don't think you can read that in any other way that Apple only supports the current version of Mac OS. I, it's, there it is, they've told you. It's gonna to be tough. Um, they did kind of make the point a bit less, made, made the point a bit weak by promptly releasing updates for Big Sur a week later. Um, I think probably what we're gonna see is updates for Safari uh, and other embarrassing updates. But in general, they're not gonna be updating old versions. And if we look, patches, updates, and other vendor mitigations for security vulnerabilities and operating systems work as well are applied within two weeks of release. I think if you put the two together, they're saying you need to be on the new version of macOS within two weeks of it being released. Not a few months later. I was, I was interestingly looking at the graphs yesterday that people were doing showing what version and that sort of inflection point when the old version is overtaken by the new version. You kind of want that point to be at week one and you want everybody over by week two. It means that you're gonna have a busy, busy, uh, I guess, autumn here, sort of spring here, summer in, in America, Northern Hemisphere. You might struggle sometimes moving to the latest version of Mac OS because perhaps your antivirus doesn't support it. This was a problem for us. We, our previous antivirus vendor, his name I won't mention, so it was, um, <laughs> took us about six months before they supported it. So we, we made that a point of moving away from it to a platform that did support it. If you're in a big organization, you might say, well, I'm a bit powerless to do anything about it. No, you're not. Change comes from within. Find out from your procurement team, how can you set vendor selection criteria? And one of those has to be supports the latest Mac OS on day zero. If they don't, move vendors, make a stink about it, make yourself known, because if you fail an EA audit because you, uh, because you can't upgrade, well, here's your chance to do something about it. One way of actually running um, old versions of the OS, you can kind of get, get away with it, is to virtualize out of support OSs. Virtualization of Mac OS is getting a bit trickier, but perhaps this is one way that can allow you to move the underlying operating system and although this isn't really part of the, E8 doesn't say that you can do it for this one, this is kind of an accepted thing in cybersecurity frameworks that you can get away with virtualizing them and it mitigates the impact of what could go wrong a little bit. Let's move on, patching applications. I have no idea. Um, I think it's pretty obvious why we want to patch applications. I'm not really gonna dig into it. Uh, this is what the E8 says. Level one, let's patch everything within a month. Level two, two weeks. Level three, two weeks, or within 48 hours. Uh, somebody's telling me yesterday, sorry, conference brain, I forget who it was. They needed to have the latest browsers installed within two hours, which I thought was pretty cool. They just had auto package run every hour. Um, but for most people, it's a bit tricky. Um, here, my amazing graphic design skills have been put to use in ways that you might patch. Um, Installer Mater didn't have a graphic, so the AI made that for me. We can talk licensing terms later. Again, I'm not gonna say much more about patching because I think every Mac conference in the past 10 years has talked about it. One thing I do wanna mention is what I've invented, it's a term I've invented called defensive patching. Uh, feel free to use it. This might be your typical Jamf Pro. You install Google Chrome, it gets installed on your machines, and then you have an upgrade policy. Smart Group says, okay, we're no longer running the latest version that means that we'll then run the upgrade Google Chrome. That's great for everything that you've installed, but what happens when your users install things? Are you patching that? Um, I thought I'd pick an example that I didn't think anybody would actually be pushing out, but three people yesterday were actually pushing out the Brave browser, so I've got that wrong. But even if you're not installing Brave, which is a privacy-focused browser if you're not familiar with it, I think you still need to be updating it. Now here, there's no installation policy for it, but if that browser has found its way onto any one of your computers, update it, just update it. Doesn't matter how it got there, just update it. 
And with all of these massive patch catalogs that we can use, I don't think we've got an excuse for not updating things, even if we haven't installed them. Well, let's talk about what version of an application is secure. Is it the latest version? The latest version is just newer, hopefully has less bugs than the last one. It's about all we can really say. Is what you think is the latest version actually the latest version? Um, we had some great talk about CI yesterday and how it can work with auto package and it sort of manages the, uh, the process. But we find that this is the flakiest part that downloading the actual patches from vendors tends to break. We had it with um, some Windows, but it was a puppet issue. The vendor moved the download location, the whole process broke. How do you know that you're actually putting out the latest version? Auto package recipes, unfortunately, break all the time. So how do you know that that is there? Is the latest version secure? I said it's just the latest version. I'm not, you know, maybe new bugs come out, but case in point, hot take, um, we use FreeCX as a phone system. It has an issue, uh, you might have seen, that came out yesterday afternoon where there was a supply chain, supply chain attack, and if you use their client, it's now got some, I don't know, malware in the client. This is available from their website, and it is a signed MSI. Okay, it's PC, but you get the point. How do you know that the latest version is really secure? It's pretty frightening. That ended up on four of our machines, and Rowan has been frantically trying to get rid of it. Um, we thought we were being good upgrading quickly, but hey, it's a bit of a nasty shock. What about software not getting updates? Um, maybe it's an old open source platform that nobody's really supporting. Um, one of the things that we've seen particularly is perpetual to subscription licensing, the amount of people who've hung on to CS6 before they, rather than going to Creative Cloud. Uh, I think, you know, really the only thing that kills that is when the, the operating system stops supporting it. So this for us is a big problem. Somebody spends $1,000 on the stats package. They don't want to upgrade to the new one because the maths hasn't changed but it's no longer getting updates. And as I mentioned before, what about software you don't install? How are you keeping that up to date? How do you know if that is not a secure application? We have a lot of overseas students and they're always saying, please can you install the Peruvian version of PayPal? Please can you have the Guatemala and WhatsApp? Whatever it is, we have no idea. We can't keep on top of uh, managing the security for these applications. So that if we go back to, to the essential eight, they say an automatic method of asset discovery and run a vulnerability scanner. Um, and so really this is what answers all of those questions that I've put up before. Uh, here are some uh, suitable vulnerability scanning platforms for the Mac. Uh, Defender just has it for free. It's probably, it's, it's pretty good, but it doesn't have the right workflows. Rapid7, Tenable, Qualsys, you can scan your entire enterprise with these. They'll do Windows, Linux, network devices, and so on. Um, Greenbone OpenVAS is a free one, and I didn't realize um, until I started doing this talk that Kanji also very soon will have vulnerability management as part of their product, which I think is pretty cool. What does this look like? Well, this is what Defender looked like for one of our Macs here. Um, as you can see, it lists all the vulnerabilities that there. This is a combined, I think, operating system and uh, patch ones. You might not be able to see, but um, there's Vim, Oracle Curl, Mac OS, and Acrobat DC. So it's a mixture of operating system things that need to be updated and applications. We look at that and then we go, okay, we need to do something. But really to get uh, properly mature in this process, we uh, need to have a workflow. So the vulnerability scanner opens up a job in JIRA or ServiceNow and says, hey, there's a problem with these 20 devices all running an insecure version. User or the service desk goes along, fix it. They say, yeah, it's done. That goes back to the vulnerability scanner and goes, well, I'll be the judge of that. And it scans it again. And if it's really done, it closes. Or if it just takes a long time because your service desks haven't got around to it or haven't figured it out and it gets fixed automatically, then fixed. It, it, it will scan again and it will then say, oh, you're not vulnerable. You've done an update and it will close your ticket. So this is really what vulnerability scanning maturity looks like. And it's possibly not the best graphic. Um, I do like the fact that they throw a bit of shade at Flash Player, even though <laughs> hopefully nobody is using it. Um, what, one thing I, I would say that it is actually quite a pragmatic um, strategy here. Internet-facing services, office productive suites, web browsers, and their extension email clients, etc. 
it's high risk applications. They are not talking about absolutely everything here. It is just the, 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 the applications that are most likely to cause you problems that you have to do. Uh, so if you do have an old stats package or whatever, it probably doesn't matter. Well, now let's talk about restricting admin privileges. You can see that this has a bit of a visceral response, and I might need to convince you. You might have thought the other ones, yeah, okay, we'd do it, or we'd do it if we had the money, but this one, it's like, I don't know, it's downright un-Apple. Um, I saw a great stat, um, which I don't have a reference for, so I haven't got it in the slides, but 80% of security incidents on endpoints occur on people who have admin rights, which sounds reasonable to me. I think that that is probably true. Why? Well, users install software. I saw this great report came out of Jamf's um, FRET team. I got that right. You can well imagine that somebody goes along to their boss and says, hey, I want Final Cut Pro to do some video editing. Boss goes, no, it's $500. They go, oh, okay, I'll just go along with Pirate Bay. They download a pirate copy of Final Cut Pro, and before you know it, your Mac is crypto mining. Okay, crypto mining is not the end of the world for an organization, but crypto mining this time, who knows what it is next time. Um, I suggest if you haven't looked at this, check it out. And as I say, it's a really good job from the Jamf uh, Fret Labs team. The ASD also says that users with admin privileges will uh, make changes to the configuration office and bypass critical security settings. So again, people muck things up. Uh, I think we've probably had three users who have asked us to uninstall the antivirus because it was stopping them installing something, and it turns out that, yes, two of them were trying to install a virus. So it's kind of important. Users install software. What do you say it wants? Say it again. I don't think you can keep up with the just ridiculous amount of software that users install. And by forcing them to go through a process, um, this is really the only way I think that you can keep on top of it. Well, what does the Essential 8 say? Again, they take a pretty pragmatic approach, I think. It, it doesn't say, no, you can't have it at all. Instead, requests for privilege access to systems and applications are validated when first requested. Validated does not mean the user submits a ticket to your service desk, they click a button and they're done. No, validated means the user demonstrates a clear business purpose for doing this, and it is understand, it understood what the, the risks are, and they might sign a user acceptance policy, which says that some of that um, liability is on them. It's not just a straightforward um, approval process. Privileged accounts are prevented from accessing the internet, email, and web services. I don't know how you're going to do that. It sounds like a great Jamf 400 scenario to me. Maybe a logon script that says, is the user an admin? And then it sets the proxy to something nonsense. Um, so yeah. It doesn't always make sense. Privileged users use separate privileged and unprivileged operating systems. Um, what they're suggesting you do here is what I said before. You run a uh, non-admin version of macOS installed on your Mac, and then you have admin rights on a VM. Um, so it's, it's a pretty sensible way of um, managing that risk. Credentials for local admin accounts and service accounts are long, unique, un uh, unpredictable, and managed. If you're wondering what they define as long, that is 30 characters. <laughs> um, how do you do this? Um, one of the main way ways people have been doing it is uh, with LAPS, and this is the uh, Mac OS version of LAPS from uh, Josh Miller. What it will do is it will randomize and set your local admin password, and it will either store it in your MDM or straight back in Active Directory if you're doing that. It's been around for a while, check it out. Um, I understand also talking to Tom that you might be able to do something along these lines with Jump Cloud, um, and I think more, more solutions are, are coming along here. Privileged access events are logged, centrally logged, and just-in-time administration is used for administering systems and applications. This is a, a trickier one. What they're saying there isn't quite what I'm going to suggest. This is really talking about using things like a Phycotic um, secret server. Uh, but on the Mac, um, from coming out of SAP was uh, privileges. Uh, Rich Trounham gave a great talk. Click the button. It makes you an admin. You might have to put in there what your reason is. And also, there is a central logging option. So everything you do can be sent to your central syslogger. So we meet all the criteria using this. I would say. This is for people in this room as well. 
don't run as an admin user every time you need it, privilege your life up. And it is a sensible way of protecting you because you are probably the most valuable from a security point of view, you're the most attractive from a security point of view targets. So I say to everybody here, use privileges, don't run as an admin. Well, what happens if you do get audited? And you're not, do you think you're gonna pass it all? Well, let's take a look. Here's the control, patch updates, vendor mitigations. Do we do it? Yes, we do. How do we do it? We use our MDM, we use Jamjar, I suppose that's Jams as an MDM, and we have a policy. Policy is really important. Policies show maturity. Policies uh, mean that you, 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 you can prove that you're actually doing it. So I'd say that patch policy is just as important as the other two. Internet Explorer 11 does not process content from the 11. Well, yeah, pretty obviously, that part of the Essential 8 doesn't apply. The Essential 8 is primarily a Windows uh, assessment framework. So we do have to take this into account. Pretty simple, we're not doing it. Execution of files prevented from within user profiles. We say, no, we're not doing that because it breaks stuff, but we are doing application control. Uh, and that is what we call a compensated control, as in a secondary control, which uh, means that the first one is not being used and we'll do that instead. So if I was auditing you, I think that's a pretty sensible compromise. Web browsers do not process web advertisements for the internet. This is an interesting one. This is actually part of user application hardening. I wonder how many people here could actually do that. I mean, we're sitting in Cremorne, Richmond really, and you think of all the companies, the tech companies around here who actually make web advertisements. Can you say to their users, no, you're gonna block the advertisements? Um, I, I don't think that it's um, particularly useful, but um, hey, we have to address it and we can say, no, this is a business requirement. We make advertisements. I even think the government makes web advertisements, so I don't quite see how they can block it across the board. It's a tough one. So how do we handle this where we're saying no? What do we do? How do we justify web browsers do not press? How do we justify the admin rights? How do we justify the fact that we're not upgrading Mac OS to the latest version within two weeks? Well, we of course do a risk assessment. Risk management is fun. And what does the risk assessment look like? Well, this is SVI's enterprise risk assessment matrix. We consider what the likelihood of something happening is, and we look at the impacts. Our impacts being chopped off the top there, put them together, how, and we get what our risk is. Low, good, medium, yeah, high and extreme, unacceptable. So let's say that we do a, a risk assessment um, on, so to go back a step, the essential eight is a set of controls. And so it's kind of doing this in reverse. Uh, because the ISD has already done this for you. But when we look at ourselves individually, we do need to start at the beginning and say, what are the risks? We might say a risk is malware, ransomware, causing disruption to an endpoint of data loss. Is that likely? Yeah. What's the consequence? Could be really bad. So that gives us a risk rating of high. And we call this our untreated risk. We then treat the risk. We don't leave it there. And we say, here are our controls, antivirus, backup, CDR, web filtering, restricting admin privileges, backups. And we say, okay, great. That has changed the likelihood to unlikely and the consequence to minor, and it has lowered it down to an acceptable risk rating. A risk can have multiple controls, and controls can be used on multiple risks. Well, we're adding there block advertisements. It hasn't actually changed it. So I, 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 I would justify it and say, look, we've done a risk assessment, and we're happy that, doesn't, that actually blocking advertisement doesn't make a change to us. We have other controls in place. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I can live with not doing that. Um, well, what about if I'm gonna say, uh, what have I taken off there? Here we've taken off admin privileges and that has changed the likelihood to possible from unlikely and given us a medium risk rating. Is that acceptable? Can we just say, yeah, we're, we're, we're cool with that. Well, maybe we can deal with it in other ways. And so we actually look at other ways of treating the risk. Risk mitigation is what we've been talking about. Those are the controls. We can transfer a risk so that it's no longer our problem. A bit tricky in this situation. Normally we're talking about cyber insurance. Cyber insurance might lower the consequences, but the consequences are already minor. So it doesn't actually help us out here. So that didn't help. 
we can assign a risk. Maybe we'll put an end user policy. And what we're doing here is we're just shoving the risk gently out of IT and onto the actual department who wants it. Doesn't help at an enterprise level, but it might help at a lower down level. Let's make it somebody else's problem. And then they get to own the medium risk rating, not you. Risk avoidance, like it sounds. Obviously, that's just put it back in there. Um, I think this is a really important uh, risk management, risk treatment strategy, because it is your ultimate trump card when you're dealing with somebody who says, no, no, I, I think we've got to do this, I don't care. You say, well, actually, I think the only way that we can manage the risk rating is to avoid it. Talk the language of people in management who make these decisions. This is a much better way of getting your opinion across. If you're arguing something, say, well, here's our risk assessment we've done, it's very hard for people to argue it. It is the language that people talk. It's not subjective. It is factual. So that's why I bring up their risk avoidance. Risk acceptance doesn't actually change it. We're, we're sticking with the medium. Ultimately, we accept all the risks because we, you know that's inherent in what it is. It, it, it's kind of a powerful way of doing things. It just says, we know that this is a medium risk for us, but we're happy with it. We understand it. We can live with it. Well, what does that look like for your assessment? You come along and get assessed. First one, fine. Second one, not, about, not interested. Execution prevented within user profiles. I think somebody who's giving you an assessment is going to go, yeah, I think you're fine there. You've actually got a better control in place. Web browsers do not process web advertisements. It's a business requirement, but we've done the risk assessment, and we don't think it makes a difference. Again, I think somebody who's doing an audit is going to say, yeah, OK, I think that's pretty good. You might get a citation. You might get a finding. But at the same time, when your boss complains about it, you can say, no, no, look, here we go. Here's the risk assessment we've done. We agreed it doesn't actually matter. And then we get to the last one. Are you doing privileged users using separate privilege and unprivileged operating environments? No, why not? Because they're developers. They don't want to. They won't do it. An auditor is going to come along and say, you're not doing that. You don't have the compensated controls in place. I'm going to give you a finding. I'm going to give you a citation. This is the fact that we've even done a risk assessment and done it. Doesn't that make it worse? Haven't we painted a target on our back? I would say, what you've done is that you've allowed your organization to understand the risk. You've allowed them to accept the risk. And if there are consequences for something that you have done, so be it. That's what being a mature organization is all about. And this is really what, the, what it comes down to for the Essential Eight, is how mature is your processes. And I think that showing that you have accepted it by showing the risk assessment shows that you are mature. Is that going to get you out of court? Is, is this your get out of jail code? Maybe, maybe not. But ultimately, what you have done is you've moved the onus off of you, off of your team, and pushed it up to your board who actually own the risk, who've accepted it. So your company might not do better, but I think you personally will do. Well, that is it. This is the obligatory photo that Tony Gray insisted that I, I place, which is my son drinking beer. Yeah. Uh, it's somewhat of an export tradition. <laughs> uh, there is with a massive stein. So thank you very much. That was the essential eight. Why I think it applies to you and strategies for man managing it.